Welcome to China Manufacturing Decoded from Sofist, the podcast where we take you through the major news and topics facing importers and manufacturers in China and Asia today. Hello, everyone. This is another episode of China Manufacturing Decoded. This is episode ninety-nine. Look at that. We're closing on the hundredth episode、uh, next week, basically. And today, I am with Andrew Armenovin. Who、uh, works in our team at Sofist and has twenty plus years of experience、uh, developing and launching electromechanical products,、uh, and we're going to go through an overview of the ver- various things that a company can optimize for when designing a new product. So you've certainly heard of design for manufacturing. Design for assembly, design for quality, design for reliability, and so on. We've talked about that several times already on, on the podcast. Here, we're going to go over and simply do an overview. Let's say it this way: do an overview of twelve things that companies might want to optimize for when developing a new product, right? When designing and developing a new product.、Uh, so, obviously. It's a lot of things for designers to keep in mind,、uh, and we're not telling everybody that they should get set up and 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 work on all of that at the same time. But simply being aware of the of these things and knowing which ones are most important for your project will probably be very very useful if you are developing new products or, or considering developing a new product. All right. So, hi Andrew,、uh, how how's it going? Is everything all right on your side? Yes, yes. Good morning, Renaud. How are you doing? Good to be here again, and nice to see you. Great, great. All right. So let's dive right into it. We broke it down into、um, several, let's say, phases of the project. What do you want to optimize for? And first, let's look at a couple of things that a company might want to optimize for、uh, that will have an impact, actually. Even before going into mass production, right? And the, the first one is design for short development and short time to market, right? So, in simple terms, if you try to develop a very technically challenging product with different modules and 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 a lot of custom developments that are part of the product and so on. Um, and it, it really tries to do something that no other product has has ever done, and it, there's a lot of unknowns. Well, it's naturally going to to take longer, right? What、uh, what would you say, Andrew? That a, a company wants to develop a new product, how do they keep the the design and development time,、uh, let's say, shorter than what it would otherwise be? Yeah, that's a great question. I think this happens all the time. Companies have hire very Uh, knowledgeable program managers and、um, uh, designers who really supposedly they know the process of the development of product end to end.、Uh, they try to do their best、uh, to do a good job in order to shorten the development time and、uh, improve the process so that everything goes smoothly to production. Unfortunately, a lot of times they run into a schedule. Deadlines where there is not enough time to really get what they、uh, get done, what they really want to get done,、uh, and、uh, in these kind of situations is where, when、um, basically there's a shortcut in quality, and and、uh, they end up not really doing all the due diligence that is required for. And getting a product done smoothly to production, and then of course the results, you know, is not going to be good at the end, either in production or in the field. Right. So you, yeah, basically that's what we discussed before about the, the NPI process, right? If if they try、exactly. to skip some some important milestones and and, and so on, it, it means higher risk in mass production. Yes,、uh, but here also, if you want to. To, to design for shorter development is really about simplifying the product, right? And that that's a theme that we'll go over again and again、uh, in this in this episode, because a simpler product actually does come with a number of benefits, 
right? So it's, it's obviously faster and cheaper to do the engineering design and put together the prototype. And it's probably, you might need, let's say, three rounds of prototypes versus maybe nine rounds of prototypes and, and, and so on and so forth, right? Um, okay, the, the second one is uh, designed for crowdfunding. So a lot of companies now develop uh, consumer goods and they're okay to pay for the industrial design, pay for the, the engineering design uh, and so on. But before investing in tooling, before committing to a first mass production run, they want to test the market. And it's also, so it, there's, there's a number of benefits of that, right? You, you test the market, you get some feedback. If it works on Kickstarter or Indiegogo, okay, you really sort of launched, uh, you know, market traction wise. You 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 get some pre-sales, so that's great. That's uh, that that's cash that w- maybe you will you will need to invest in tooling and so on, and it forces you a crowdfunding campaign. Really forces you to put together a nice marketing content and really be very clear about who you target, and then actually very often go out there and do the. Um, do all of the the, the, the communication, the, the, the advertising and so on that you need to do to spread the word. And so if it works for that campaign, it you probably already qualified also the, the marketing channels to sell your product, right? So there's a lot of benefits. And there's also some downsides about, you know, opening up and what you're doing before even you're on the market and so on. So there's, there's a lot of pros and cons, but a lot of companies go for that. So if they want to design for, for crowdfunding, what, what should it do, right? Certain types of products tend to do well on Kickstarter and Indiegogo. And if you right. go on it, like these days, you know, I don't know, in the past year, there were a lot of uh, electronic bikes, for example, e-bikes. Right. And, and there's certain categories like this that are a very good fit. And there's some other product categories that are not a very good fit. So you, you might first want to, to double check on your concept before going in, 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 into that. Yeah. And, you, it has to have some kind of cool aspect to it or a smart aspect or something that, that really differentiates it uh, in a way that, that will look good on, on that kind of platform. And number three, if you design for crowdfunding, you really want to plan for, for that from the start to get to a, a prototype that really looks good as early as possible because this would really be instrumental in in your campaign so that that's yeah design for crowdfunding uh let's go into the the next stages because we have 12 of them to to cover Um, yes let's get to the the aspects that you want to optimize for uh that you know that will really allow you to reap benefits during production and the two big ones we're going to spend a bit more time on these ones are design for manufacturing and design for assembly. So yeah. maybe Andrew, can you can you walk us through uh, first DFM, d- design for manufacturing? What usually uh, does that entail? Well, design for manufacturing, DFM, and also design for assembly, DFA. All of these are part of a DFX, design for excellence type of process. I think sometimes people think a little bit, overthink this whole process. But really what it is, is that you want to think of all the good things that you can actually do for your design so that your design is more reliable, more easy to manufacture, lesser problems, lesser returns. And basically all around is, you know, quality design. And, um, uh, and that's really what design for excellence is. You know, you want to make sure that, uh, for example, when we're talking about this DFM, design for manufacturability, you want to make sure that the design that you have is going to be unique uh, in in terms of um, one way to manufacture and not have any kind of strange failures come up that you can't uh, figure out and fix. Uh, make sure all your suppliers of your parts are qualified, approved, your parts have been analyzed and uh, um, by either component engineering and or you have reviewed the part data from your suppliers. Uh, you're making sure that your manufacturing equipment is all calibrated, um, well-tested and all ready to manufacture. Your team 
are uh, well trained. And so really it's all about excellence in all areas. Uh, you're making sure that, you know, once you run your pro process in manufacturing, yeah, you, you have a, a control plan, you have a, a you manage the process in, in such a way that you get great yields. And so all of these put together come up to be a DFX, uh, I mean, DFX for DFM, uh, meaning for uh, design for manufacturability. And the same way, DFA, design for assembly, is actually part of the manufacturing as well. So it's an input to the whole manufacturing process. And so in order to be able to have a really good assembly line process. First of all, your assembly line itself has to be designed well so that uh, you don't have a human factor there where uh, operator comes to work uh, not feeling well and all of a sudden affects the whole reliability and quality of the line. You don't want that to happen. You don't want to have a situation where there's a lot of variability in going from one operator to another or or uh, impact of for example uh, not not enough jigs or automated process where uh, assembly and everything is all so much manual so much variable that is not going to help the assembly process in terms of dfa so the whole purpose of the dfa is you want to make sure that the assembly is going to be mistake proof uh the assembly line is going to be continuously uh in terms of qu uh, quality and reliability uh, going to be consistent lesser va variability uh, from one operator to another and at the end basically the product is is uh, excellent product ready to test and it's going to pass the final test. And that's really the goal. And if you can achieve that by making sure that your operators are trained well, your line is designed well so that one operator is not overloaded and another one is, you know, sitting idle. Uh, and then your parts are uh, basically managed in a way that, you know, you, you have the proper jigs uh, that are automated in the process so that you have consistent for example, connectivity in, in these jigs or uh, whatever you're doing. Uh, so when, when you have this, this sort of process, you end up getting a very nice uh, design for assembly. So you, you, you basically your assembly line is going to deliver exactly what you're looking for. And eventually, if you have the FM in place too, then then you can look for uh, really good, good yields. You, basically, you, you're going to achieve those two goals. Right, right. So taking a step back, let's say I'm a product designer. I start to put together the the, the mechanical drawings and, and I start to qualify some of the components and I start to think of, you know, what, what needs to be custom designed versus maybe reusing something standard on the market. What, how, how does all of that affect me? Uh, because a lot of the things you said... Um, often come a little bit later uh, and, and that might that might be a mistake, right? A lot of the things that we're saying here is that really from the start of the product design, we should plan for the impact of what is designed on manufacturability, assembly, you know, quality, lead times, and so on. So what what would be a few a few tips if if you had you know a few bullet points to 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 give to to, to a product designer, what, what would they have to, to keep in mind? I think what uh, I would say is that, you know, if you are designing a product, make sure you think about first thing is the end user, the customer, and the environment that the product will be used. That is probably the most important critical. And in this case, then you realize that, okay, the parts and the product needs to be designed in, in a way that is going to suit the environment that is going to be used and the customer use case environment as well. Uh, once you've achieved that, and then the rest of it is how I'm going to design this, how I'm going to test it, and how am I going to manufacture it in such a way so that it will be an excellent product at the end. Mm -hmm. And to do that, then you have to think about basically every uh, aspect of the design that could, could impact the assembly process and the manufacturing process, the testability, testing process, and so forth, reliability and quality. Once you have thought about this and you have communicated 
with the cross-functional teams and come up with some kind of a maybe a checklist that said, okay, yeah, we did this, uh, we did this, and maybe you can do this. And, and des- delegate it to the right teams, uh, the right tasks that need to be done to basically cover all aspects of the, for example, design for reliability, design for manufacturability, design for uh, assembly, design for testability. So what, once you have this kind of a uh, uh, setup where you're making sure that every team does their own due diligence on their areas, you know, for example, designing designers that are designing for the assembly in production, they know what they need to do so that their assembly line is mistake proof. You know, the reliability team says, okay, well, uh, I'm going to design a reliability test plan that is going to cover all aspects of the weird situation that the product could be used uh, in the field that I want to make sure we test it and you know, cover those uh, areas. And, and the same way in manufacturing, you know, um, they want to make sure that uh, all the equipment is manu- uh, that they need to use is all calibrated and all the uh, team members are all uh, trained well for doing what they're supposed to be doing. It's, it's kind of like a football team, really. Uh, you <laughs> want to make sure that everything and everyone knows the plan, knows the game, and when we push that button, start and go, then everyone is working together kind of in a cohesive way, in a way that is going to get us results. Right, right, right. Yeah. And you, you covered both product design and process design. Yeah. Uh, so usually to get back to product designers, things that usually improve at the same time cost, uh, you know, complexity and, and the likelihood of issues in the development the probability for quality issues, the probability for reliability issues. What what are these things? Usually, there's this sort of um, general guidelines, right? And I'm sure most product designers have uh, have heard of that. But we can go through the list quickly. Uh, the fewer parts, the better. Uh, if there's a lot of different parts and a lot of um, fasteners or you know different ways to to assemble and, and fix the parts to each other, obviously the more um, you know, the higher the likelihood that something goes wrong somewhere in the assembly, but also later in the field that the product somehow breaks, right? Using common parts uh, rather than a lot of different parts uh, is, is a good thing. Using standard of the shelf parts rather than custom design parts, uh, that, that's a very big, uh, very big plus simply because a lot of these standard parts have already been uh, made in the tens of thousands or in the millions and all the, the quirks have been worked out. And, and right. the, uh, in the best cases, you even get the reliability test results and the certification for, for compliance uh, test results and, and so on and so forth. And so the risks here are much, much lower. Making assembly easier. So Andrew, you mentioned uh, mistake proofing, uh, things like making it easy to, to, um, to self-locate uh, the parts when they assemble into each other and, and, and just remove any opportunities for, um, let's say, awkwardness, right? How, how do they, like, I'm going to fumble a bit here when I put this together. So uh, and it can makes I just, sure there's only one way to assemble. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like assemble from top to bottom. Right. Make sure that it cannot be put the wrong way. Like it cannot, there's, if there's a exactly. risk, maybe put a pin or something to make it very obviously impossible. So, okay, okay, the, the oper- okay that's the right way. Clock. Make, make it like press fit, make it with, with some kind of click that's pretty obvious. Right. And all of these are very, exactly. very good, um, very, very, very good uh, approaches. Uh, now, talking about DFM and DF- DFA, before we go to the other DFX, you know, uh, factors, you know, that, that designers can optimize for, the, the, the last thing on that is that in the sort of the, the textbooks, right, about um, design for manufacturing and assembly, they, they suggest something interesting is that they say, of course, you're going to manufacture the parts before you assemble the parts. But when you think of how the product is going to be manufactured and you want to optimize things, first, actually, you consider assembly. And then you think, okay, how to make it with fewer parts? How to make it in a more simple way? And then you think, okay, now these parts, like instead of having 
38 different parts. Actually, we thought of how to combine things and so on. Then we're going to figure out how to manufacture them. And in some cases, the trade-off is we're going to make some parts maybe that are a bit more complicated, you know, the molding, you know, of the custom parts and maybe some overmolding and something. There are already going to be more complex parts right out of the, the tooling. However, when this has been studied, they found that it's much, much better to, to go with, a, with, with more complex parts that require a much more simple assembly. And that's kind of the opposite of what everybody's been doing in China, right? Do you, <laughs> do you have that yeah. feeling? Yeah, I think that uh, everything is going to kind of modulization. So uh, because once you've got a module that has been already uh, manufactured in a, a high yield environment, then all you have to do is just assemble the modules. So, um, and each module is considered one component, really. And so then that way it looks like you're actually assembling very little parts. You know, you're, mod, you're you got uh, 10 modules you're connecting, that's 10 parts. It's much easier to do that than assembling, you know, 100 different parts and you got, uh, you know, 300 people working on the assembly line and, the, the the more people uh, you have the, and the more parts you have, uh, you are increasing a chance of some kind of a mishap or failure and, uh, and reliability goes down, as you know. Uh, and, and I think that um, those are great ideas, uh, you know, when it comes to, for example, mobile phone uh, system, and, you know, when you're assembling mobile phone, it used to be that y- y- you had to assemble every single part. And that just was not only hell and, and the reliability was terrible, uh, but now they have pretty much like modulized it. You know, the, the display assembly is just one module. That's it. You know, it, the whole display, all the electronics, everything is all combined into one module. You put that in the cover, which is another part, and then you just connect it to the main, uh, you know, PCB. And now you've got, you know, three parts there. And then you got another uh, ba- battery and some other uh, uh, covers and, and so forth. Basically less than 10 different modules and, and you've got the, the whole thing assembled. In fact, the wonderful thing about uh, modulization is also is that uh, you can repair it easily. Uh, basically, you know, you, you can troubleshoot and find out where the problem is. Then you realize that, okay, it's in this module. You just replace that module. And, and actually cost of repairs go down in that kind of way. And, and in fact, I think a, a while back, a Toyota did that with their products. Basically, you just had to figure out and troubleshoot where the problem was. And you just, boom, you just take that part out and put another part in. And that's why a lot of people loved Toyota because they could just do the repairs themselves. And, and so I think, uh, go into that direction and eventually everything is going to go to <laughs> disposable, right? Uh, the price of mobile phone will go down uh, to a point that, I mean, if they let it, <laughs> so that... I'm not sure uh, about that. Yeah. Ask Apple <laughs> about that. <laughs> I don't think it's going to happen so soon anyway. But yeah, I mean, uh, uh, eventually a uh, modulization is going to get to a point where uh, you can just have uh, maybe, you know, five pieces and then you just have a very short assembly line for DFA um, a lot of the process is going to be automated and or it's going to be in a, in a way that uh, the manual assembly is not going to affect the liability or quality. Right, all right. Yes. Um, so I was going to mention that electronic suppliers go the way automotive suppliers have been going. And then you mentioned Toyota. Uh, yeah, to- Toyota and Honda, in, in starting in, in really in the 80s, came out with very nicely engineered vehicles. And it took took the other companies, the competitors, you know, a bit more time to get into really good engineering. But yes, that, that's really what they've been trying to do. I mean, it's not like they build their, their own seats, for example. You know, they work with uh, Foresia, or, you know, there's, there's like two or three big suppliers that are really specialized in seats. And then they just take the seat and, 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 and then they have a way, maybe they need a mechanical arm, uh, I mean, you can assist to put it clock into the vehicles uh, uh, nicely without um, being too strenuous for the operator. But really, that, that's all they do when it comes to the seats and to so many other parts of the, you know, the, the fittings inside the, 
the, the, the card that they assemble, uh, definitely. Okay, so we touched on design for manufacturing, design for assembly, and we also touched on a number of other things. Uh, let, let's touch on, touch on another big one, design for quality. So basically, all that we've been discussing with DFM and DFA really does help with quality, right? And when you, and I just want to go back to something you mentioned about modularization is that these modules, a lot of the time, they're sort of standard. They can be reused on several, maybe several models of mobile phones, as you, as you mentioned, or tablets or, or, yes. uh, or several cars of the same platform, right? So that's really the idea. You, you want to, to avoid too much customization, discovering too many issues with something new. You want to reuse something that has been tried and tested. Is, is that a big thing? Oh, that's a huge thing. I, I think what you mentioned is exactly, you know, uh, one of the biggest manufacturing discoveries. So basically, when you have modulized, then uh, you standardize as well. And then when you standardize, then uh, the next mobile phone can actually use any one of these modules in order to do that. I mean, they... Little by little, everything is going to be standardized uh, because when it's standardized, the price goes down, uh, the liabilities increases, and the development time decreases tremendously. So you basically, here it is, there's a product in the market that can do the Bluetooth and the Wi-Fi. Boom, you just, everything is all there. You just click it, put it in, and you're ready to go. Why would you want to design your own wi- Wi-Fi from scratch anymore, uh, right? So, so it, it's all about that kind of uh, the, the approach. So I, I, I agree with you. I think that this whole modularization is, is driving standardization and eventually is really all uh, basically driving the effects. And yes. uh, uh, as you mentioned, uh, when it comes to quality, uh, quality and reliability are the biggest part of the whole product. I mean, why would you make a product that is not going to be high quality? And why would you uh, make a product that's not going to last long in terms of operation? And that's the reliability part of it. So I think that uh, uh, when it comes to design for quality, there are so many aspects that need to be taken into account. So maybe you can mention a few of them and then we can discuss that. So things that we've mentioned before, such as using fewer parts, uh, fewer fasteners, uh, making the assembly easier, mistake-proofing the assembly operations, and so on. All of that goes directly into uh, better quality. And I think Correct. that's rather uh, rather obvious. Also, when you do design for manufacturing, and you wonder, okay, can we make that at the required quality level? You know, very often I mean, I notice designers are kind of surprised. So, you know, they come to us and the most common example, it, it comes up like at least once a month is I want to have this metal piece, uh, metal part. And I want it to be, I want the surface to be anodized. Uh, like, okay, and it's going to be relatively high volume. So let's do casting. You know, let's die cast this piece of aluminum, for example. And then, okay, and then, you you know, it's going to be porous, not going to be great with anodizing. You know, there's going to be an issue here, right? The yield is going to be low, meaning that there's going to be a lot of defects, probably, right? So maybe that's something we need to to step back a bit and reconsider, or maybe change the, the, the kind of finishing, maybe change the process to get something closer to what you want, right? The, and, and, and there's a lot of these... Um, these trade-offs that that come up, and the, the earlier you you think about them, the, yeah, the fewer issues and the more straightforward your development process, right? I'm sure you've seen a lot of cases like that too. Absolutely, absolutely. I think I think that uh, you know uh, exactly what you said. You know, DFA, DFA, and 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 the fact that your mistake proof, all of those contribute to quality, uh, but also the procedures and processes, training. Uh, the teams and making sure everyone understands what they're supposed to be doing is also part of that quality as well. You know, inspection uh, process, an auditing process, uh, qualifying the suppliers, for example, and and making sure that the parts that you receive from your suppliers are tested and qualified before you put it in your process. So assurance of knowing what you're doing is important because uh, if you have doubts whether this part has been tested or not, boy, that 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 could throw a wrench in your whole design. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, just simple things like that, just the doubt. Uh, so it's, it's very important that, uh, uh, you know, as a checklist uh, on the quality side, you, you're checking with your team and you're saying, Hey, you know, you're designing this. Have you checked if the supplier is a qualified supplier? Uh, who's using it? Who, who are their customers? Have you been to their uh, factory and audited them? Are they capable of uh, producing the volumes that we're looking for? Are they, do they have qualified test teams? How do they test it? Did you even ask for qualification test report? I mean, simple questions from quality manager uh, from the team in the team meetings uh, really generates huge amount of um, discussions around uh, what needs to be done because a lot of times especially engineering teams are so busy uh, with their designs and and um, uh, schedules they really don't even think about quality uh, mm-hmm. and I and I mean this is the true thing it happens all the time that's why you have a quality manager to kind of as a re- remind the, the team that you have to do this because if you don't we're going to be in you know big trouble so yeah. I, I think that uh, you know a lot of times some companies you know at least in the past uh, have overlooked quality especially like brand new companies that they they're just like you know uh, startups and so forth um, they don't even hire a quality teams or liability right. Team right. for right. A, quite a while right you know yeah. that it, right. but I think it's a huge mistake in fact quality and liability teams should be in right up front. Why? Because the impact of them, if they're not there, will show in the field later. And this has happened all the time. Next thing you know, uh, after two years, you know, the startups are hiring quality director. Why? What happened? Well, we have shipped several products and we have all kinds <laughs> of issues in the field and we don't know how to fix it. Well, if you hired me way up front, then I, you wouldn't have this problem. <laughs> yeah, right, right. right. Better, better late than never. I mean, but if you do it earlier, it's going to save you a lot of money. Yes. And, and this is really about design because the, who picks the component suppliers? Typically, it's the designers. And they need to at least ask the right questions to see yes. the difference between a supplier that will deliver them 10 parts that would make their prototype work versus a supplier that will deliver 10,000 parts right. with, with high quality. is very, exactly. very different. Very different. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Packaging. I was going to skip that one, but it's, it, it's a simple one, but one that also people tend to forget is they say, okay, we're going to, to ship this yeah, e-commerce, you know, whatever. And then we, we've had a project, I remember, where um, they... They were doing all their cost calculations. They said, okay, and we're going to send this with a FedEx uh, standard package. And da, da, da. okay, it works. And then they started to design the thing. And, uh, and then they, they, they noticed, oh, actually, it's going to be heavier or, or too large, I forget, for the standard package. So we're going to get to that other package. Oh, and now the whole thing crumbles. The whole economic model crumbles. Now, what do we do? And they, they figured out they, you know, they had to go back and redesign the whole thing or they would never make money on their product. Right. Um, so packaging is, is, is quite, um, quite important. And I think we don't need to cover that in depth, but it's something that people need to, 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 to plan for. So at least have a plan for it uh, and, and, and verify uh, the plan, the assumptions. Yeah, I totally agree. I, yeah. I, I'll, you know, I just want to make a small point, point on the packaging. I think packaging is, is very, very important from a few points of view. In the eye of the customer, sometimes the packaging might mean uh, brand reliability, brand uh, quality, and or brand reputation. You know, you, you get a, a highly reputable brand, you're expecting that you're going to get a really good uh, package that looks nice, looks beautiful, contains the product in a way that is safe, and that is going to hold the product safe and high quality and uh, high reliability through the whole transportation, through different kind of environments that this, this packaging is going through. And at the end, is going to make it to the hands of the user intact with no failures to the product or damages to the to the package i think that um of course as you know you can overdo the packaging you know 
uh, something that really doesn't need to be that expensive. You don't need to package it, you know, in heavy duty expensive stuff, but at the same time, uh, you, you have to balance it. And that balance is the trick. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Just to summarize on, on packaging, I think the, there's like the outer packaging doesn't really matter in terms of impression, but the unit packaging is really part of the product. It's really part of the experience of I unpack yes. it and I, I take the product out and everything. And there's more and more brands like Apple and others that, that really pay a lot of attention to that. And the, the key objectives usually are protect the product, make sure there's a nice experience exactly. and, uh, and, and at the same time, balance it with the, the costs of, uh, of shipments, right? Or exactly. courier uh, for e-commerce. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay, let's go into yeah the, the elements that really come up after the sale, when the users have the product in their hands, right? Design for reliability and design for maintainability. And you touched on that earlier. So you, you say that a designer should really first think of the, the use case, the user scenario and the the use environment, like who's going to use it, where, how, is it going to be outside, inside, is it going to be, what temperature is it going to be, blah, 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 right? And in let's say in big companies, would they typically start to put together some kind of risk analysis in a little bit of a formal manner? Or how, how would they handle that? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question because I, I think that it depends on, on the type of uh, company they are. For example, uh, big military contractors uh, or big companies that they have very heavy duty product that needs to be high reliable, highly reliable. Uh, those companies definitely think about reliability and quality and they try to start up immediately, right? Uh, with, with the thinking about design for reliability, you know, for example, they already have like a car fact, car companies, you know, they, they already know or think about, for example, right up, right from the start, uh, what kind of a life they want for the, for their product and product liability life, for example, 10 years, 30 years and so forth. And, and then uh, they definitely have an experienced reliability engineering team that actually starts working on concepts of the reliability philosophy and even the theoretical reliability in, term, in terms of analyzing the life of the product, trying to design uh, for reliability right from the start, working with the design team and making sure the design team really understands what the end product should look like, how it should fare in the environment and in the hands of the user, and uh, how um, you should think about every aspect of the reliability in the design at the early stages of the design. And then usually in startups and so forth, as, as I mentioned, sometimes they forget about it at the beginning, but then soon they realize that, okay, that we, we really need to get into this. And maybe at least uh, right after the prototype, they start thinking, okay, how can we make this product more reliable? And they realize that, okay, they had some components from suppliers that are not reliable uh, suppliers. Uh, they can't meet the, uh, the long-term goals of the design in terms of reliability life, in terms of reliability, uh, you know, uh, let's say environments that they, they have to go, temperature uh, variations and so forth. So they quickly start looking for uh, suppliers that can meet those uh, requirements. And, and so uh, when it comes to design for reliability, I think that majority of the teams need to uh let's say at least in the development team you know they they need to be aware of as you said the use case uh the field of uh, use case and uh, uh, the customers as well as uh, the environment that the, the product is going to be used and then with the help of a reliability team they need to choose uh suppliers that can meet those reliability goals components that can meet those reliability goals and then a design for reliability process that they have to take into account to make sure that the design itself is going to meet the reliability goals and then so once you think about it and i when i mean like when i say design design for reliability goals for example um they might have to uh do a part count or 
some kind of liability allocation or perhaps uh, viable analysis on the parts on the design itself and or do uh, some, uh, for example, um, using the software and so forth, you can uh, come up with some kind of MP MTPF analysis. Uh, at least it's an estimate. It, it gives you some ideas of where the product is going to uh, start up in terms of design for reliability. And then uh, you start working on designing test cases that can actually mimic the environment and the use case, uh, the worst case analysis of the environment and the use case. And then in this case, you are going to be able to uh, detect and maybe even predict and or uh, find early defects that could happen. And, and that's the, really the key for design for reliability because you really want to find those uh, serious defects that could happen in the field way early in the design. And once you find it, for example, in the, in the EBT, DBT, then you have fixed it. And once you've fixed it, you're not going to see those in the field again. But most often what happens is that I think definitely one of these things happens. Uh, either you have an on a not so much experienced reliability team that they don't design a, a test case that can actually find the issues. Uh, for example, the test case could be loose, too loose, uh, and uh, basically it passes everything. That's not good. Uh, and or you could have completely the reverse side. You, you'd have a test case that it fails everything and, and uh, it's, almost, it's almost like a test of failure and that's not good. So a good experience reliability engineer knows exactly where the fine line is, where it meets uh, the operational goals, but at the same time has a design, uh, has a reliability margin so that it, it actually doesn't go all the way to test of failure, but it, uh, make sure the product is uh, tested for that unusual uh, environment and or uh, use case. Right. And just to make sure people uh, get it, when you say the reliability objectives, it might be something like when used in these circumstances by this type of people, that many times per week, for example, it will last, you know, it, it will not fail for the first three years, you know, uh, right. 95% of the time, right? That is wonderful. I'm glad so you, you mentioned that because that, that, is, that is one of the fundamental uh, ways of creating that test case. And uh, mm. I think a keyboard is a very good example of that. You know, someone who is using a keyboard in the office versus someone who is using a keyboard for gaming. Uh, yes, know, quite different. <laughs> yeah. right? Banging quite different. on the keys and uh, using it for a longer period of times versus someone who's just sitting nicely and, and uh, you know, very safely. So I think um, what, you, what you mentioned is an excellent example of how you create the test cases that meets the right uh, use case environment. And then all of these, a combination of all of these really come up to be DFX for reliability DFR. And in, in terms of the design, you want to make sure that, for example, if it's a mobile phone, uh, the design team understands that, you know, this thing is going to fall. And how do I protect the display from breaking when it falls? Right, because it, it's all about fitting back to the, 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 the product design and seeing, okay, maybe we picked the wrong component here. Maybe we need to add... Um, had some redundancy here because this might fail and, and so on and so forth, right? Oh, I and mean, when it falls on that angle, this is really uh, easy to break. Actually, uh, maybe we need to change the, this, this component a bit or something. Yes, yes. That, right. that makes like sense. In old days, you know, old days, you know, you, you design in the, uh, the display. Nobody even thought about the fact that you could drop the phone. In fact, they said, no, you shouldn't drop it. If, if you drop it, you're going to break it because it's glass. Of course, it's going to break, you know. Uh, but then when you started thinking about design for reliability, you said, no, well, uh, is there something we can do to pre prevent the glass from breaking? How about creating some kind of an edge to protect the glass and so forth? And so this way of thinking, it started uh, making the design thing. Oh, maybe maybe we should do that. Let's see what happens. And then they realized that really improved the uh, the reliability just on on that one little design improvement. And then they started uh, working on another, another, and so on. And so, really, design for reliability means how can I think of ways to improve the design so that that is the so when 
for example, the product has been dropped or, you know, uh, water splash on it, how can I make it more uh, reliable so that it can still work after a small splash of water, for example? Right, right, right. absolutely. Let's go in, we still have three to cover, so I'm going to go a little bit uh, faster on them. Let's go over design for maintainability. So simple example is, you know, if you drive a car, you can do an oil check from time to time. And it's really not that complicated to see if there's, you know, insufficient oil or if it's between the two bars, basically. Uh, right. right. So that that's really a, um, a simple Simply, uh, simply, or the self-diagnostic also of the car, right? You have some, uh, some, some, some lights that will pop up and alert you. There's a lot of ways that this can be done, uh, but also maintainability is also about making it easy to to replace. So what you mentioned about the modules, of course, if you have, you were talking about a phone or, or a tablet or something. Well, the, the people, if the people already have that module in stock. It's not that complicated to remove the old one, to put a new one, boom. Quick test, does it work and, and, and go ahead, right? That, that's, in a nutshell, that's the idea, isn't it? It is. Uh, maintainability, of course, is part of reliability as well, you know, because, uh, you know, you've got heavy equipment or heavy electronics that you, you know, you, you need to make sure that they are going to, you um, maintain the functionality and the same quality and reliability in terms of function uh, and and maintain it for the years to come. And uh, I think you're right. Um, Automobile is a perfect example of how uh, they have put in uh, signals, for example, uh, how frequently you need to change the oil and, and um, you, you need to change the belts, for example, and so forth. Uh, I think um, the same way that you can do that, you can do some of that or similar things in, um, for example, I think, I'm not sure which one, I think it's Apple iPhone that checks the health of the battery. And it actually allows you to know that the battery is time to change and replace. If you don't, then you, you could have not only a dangerous environment situation where the battery can explode, but also more frequently, uh, you're not going to have much battery to work with. You know, you, yeah. it's going to tell you, you only have 50% battery, but in reality you have like 10 minutes of battery as opposed to 50%. So, so I think that little by little, some of those things are being, um, implemented in the electronics, uh, for example, now we have electronic diagnostic systems so that it does a diagnostic test. And these diagnostic tests will actually tell you basically about the health of the, every component, uh, every module. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. it will tell you if your uh, display is working okay, if your uh, keyboard is working okay, for example, um, you know, battery working okay mm-hmm. and so on. And I think that eventually, um, maintainability uh, is going to be part of the whole reliability. And I think it already is, but I think that uh, it's going to be more and more uh, where the softwares are improving and there'll be more of a diagnostic type of system built in already. Yeah, definitely. Since it also helps definitely with quality because it makes it easier to test automatically the product. Uh, so during, let's say, during manufacturing and manufacturing, and also in the field, we send an alert when something is not working. It's really uh, two birds with one stone here. Uh, yeah. And maintainability is going to be more and more important for electrical products in general because there are different regulations coming up, uh, going to force the, the, you know companies to design products that can be repaired is the right for repairability, right? So that we're gonna, we're certainly gonna talk about that uh, further. Uh, in in the future, and then the the last three, I'm just gonna go through them quickly. Uh, design for ease of use and ergonomics. Of course, obviously, you want to make sure you you want to get feedback from users uh, relatively early, and you want to put it in their hands, and you want to see how how it works. Because if it's not user friendly, not ergonomic, well, th- there's gonna be there's gonna be uh, obviously uh, issues. And another one is design for fewer SKUs. So that, that's a mistake that we, we noticed with several of our clients is that they want to have product and then it's got to be, you know, three sizes times 
uh, two colors, and then you start to have a lot of SKUs, but then actually, hey, guy, wait a minute. Right. Well, it doesn't really make much sense. Uh, you're going to have a lot of inventory to manage. You, got, you, you, you don't know yet which ones will sell better, or you have to do a bit more market research and you need to really right. focus on just maybe one size, one color to start. And then after that, you will see what people, if people ask for maybe bigger or, or smaller than maybe second size and, and so on, but really don't go too, too, uh, too deep into that. And then the last one is designed for sustainability or let's say getting closer to sustainability. That's also a trend. Right. Uh, people, uh, we, we get asked more and more often, how can we use some something else? Maybe some kind of bioplastic or some other materials that can be biodegradable. Right. Um, but that's not really sustainable, but maybe some others that... That, that are very, very easy to recycle without losing any of, it, of the material um, integrity and, and, and properties and everything uh, once they're recycled. Uh, th- there's a lot of things about around that. I'm not going to go into this in, in detail, but that, that's another one of these mega trends. So we, we, we're just under an hour here. So I think it's, it's time to, 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 uh, to, to close the, the episode. So we went through 12 objectives that uh, product designers can optimize for. And really the big ones where we spent the most time were uh, designed for manufacturing and assembly, designed for reliability, designed for quality. Because this right. really, um, you, you really can't go uh, into manufacturing without these. Uh, if you want to, if you at least want to get your product made at, an acceptable cost without too many bad surprises. And if you don't want to, to die because of the cost of returns, complaints, warranties, loss of reputation, and so on, this is really the, let's say the basics. If you, if you want to, to get to market and survive and make some money, right? The question yeah. is how to implement this. And I think that a lot of companies uh, really don't know how, uh, and or they get confused or they, they start thinking it's going to take too much time. So the best way to do it is to designate a uh, program manager who's actually managing the whole project uh, program and then uh, put them to work with a quality manager together. Together, they need to implement check sheet for every one of these uh, DFXs. So, for example, for reliability team, all right, go ahead and give me all the things that you could do for design for reliability. So they'll come up with a bunch of ideas. And then what will really happen is that design for reliability team is actually uh, given some of those uh, important tasks sort of for the designers and some of them, they take it themselves. Design for assembly, design team is given it to manufacturing and some of it, they design it themselves, but someone has to manage. And that will be the uh, PM and quality where they want to check everybody, make sure that, okay, there were goals and uh, set for assembly. Are they done? Are they ready for uh, the next step and so forth? And tracking of these uh, tasks has to be done by the PM. Yeah, no, that, yeah, that, that's really how, uh, agreed. Yes, that, that's how it works usually when it works well. Uh, and one last thing, how does it get done? Well, go where there's expertise and ask for reviews of the design. And that, I mean, that, that, that's a part of, you know, what, what we do and a lot of, of, lot of companies that have this kind of expertise do is they review design and they give some feedback and they challenge, they ask questions. And, uh, and, and that's really what helps make the, the designs, uh, much, yeah, much better, makes, helps make much, much better product. So, yeah, on, on that note, uh, thanks so much, Andrew. That was a great one. A lot of actionable content, quite educational. So I think, uh, I think, I think it was a great one. And, uh, thanks everybody for listening. And we'll be back next week for episode 100. Can you believe it? <laughs> All right. Thanks yeah. everybody. Thanks again for listening to this podcast brought to you by the Sophie's Group. We're on a mission to provide you with everything you need to manufacture effectively in Asia, including inspections, auditing, new product development support, contract manufacturing, 3PL warehousing and fulfillment, and much, much more across Asia's key manufacturing areas. 
visit us at sofeast.com. That's S-O-F-E-A-S-T dot com to learn more and get help. If you've enjoyed the podcast today, please do rate, review and share because it will really help others discover us too.